Hello, I'm Cheryl, and this is Sleep Tight Relax, a calming bedtime podcast for the young and young at heart. It's time to get cozy in bed and listen to tonight's story. Our sleep story tonight is the sixth part of the magic soap bubble. Ned and the giant have found the princess's brother and have brought him back to the castle. The prince is worried his stepfather, the king, will return and turn him back into a bird but the group gets ready for bed and awaits the stepfather's return. When the king arrives, things do not go well. Ned calls to the bluebird and sends it off with the gold ring to get help. But when the ring slips off and into the water, the bluebird is afraid that there will be no help coming. If you are laying down warm and secure in your bed, let's start with taking some deep belly breaths. If you aren't in bed yet, or maybe you are just taking some time to relax, that is okay too. Take a slow, deep breath in through your nose, as big a breath as you can, and as slowly as you can, Then slowly let the air out through your mouth. Try it again. Take a deep breath in. And let the air slowly flow out. Take a deep breath in. And now out. If you haven't already, consider closing your eyes, or you can look at a spot above you. Imagine you are lying on a fluffy white cloud. It lifts you off the ground and into the sky. You are free to float and relax. Let your body sink into the cloud. As you imagine yourself floating, continue to take deep belly breaths. If a worry comes into your mind, just let it float away like all the clouds that are surrounding you. Continue using your imagination like this as long as you like, as we continue with part six of the magic soap bubble. Ned followed the beautiful princess and her brother into the castle, while the giant, who had to stoop nearly to the floor in order to enter the doorway, brought up the rear. As it was late, everyone decided to go to bed. Besides, they were all tired out after their exciting day. You would have laughed to see the giant ascend the stairway to the royal bedrooms, for the steps were too small for his feet, and it was with great difficulty that he managed to get a foothold with the toes of his boots. When at last he was safely inside his bedroom, the largest in the castle, they realized that the bed was not nearly long enough for him. So the princess gave orders that two beds be placed ends together, and in this way, the giant, by allowing his feet to go out through the open window, could lie down at full length. His feet nearly reached the tree that grew just outside, on which the little bluebird had perched for the night, and it was lucky indeed that it was midsummer for otherwise, our big friend might have caught a severe cold. 
After bidding the giant good night, the little bluebird had a few minutes talk with Ned while he undressed himself. She agreed to act as guard during the night to keep a lookout from the treetop and in case of approaching danger, instantly to awaken Ned and the giant. Gradually, the great castle grew quiet until nothing was stirring, not even a mouse. At times, the night wind rustled the leaves in the tree where the little bluebird sat, winking and blinking. And the big yellow moon glistened fantastically on the big toe of the giant. Towards midnight, a faint sound in the distance, like the beat of horses' hooves, startled the bluebird. Quickly flying toward the castle entrance, she gazed out upon the roadway that wound up from the valley below. At some distance, she made out dimly the figures of a number of horsemen. Returning swiftly to the castle, she tweaked the giant's big toe. That, you can easily imagine, woke him with a start. What's the matter? He asked in a frightened whisper, which, although only a whisper, was enough to make the whole castle tremble, thereby waking Ned and the princess herself. The stepfather of the princess is coming, answered the bluebird. Oh, then it's all over for me, cried the giant. He'll change me back into a pine tree. The bluebird made no reply but went quickly to find Ned. On entering his bedroom through the half-open window, she found him already dressed. Take the ring, he said, slipping it over her glossy neck after she had informed him of what she had seen. If you can manage to touch him with it, this man will find that he has no power whatsoever to harm us. I will go quickly, replied the little bird, for they must have reached the drawbridge by now. So saying, she flew swiftly away and reached the other side of the moat just as they set foot upon the bridge. Awaiting her opportunity to touch the stepfather of the princess with the magic ring, she landed quietly on the tip of a spear which one of the horsemen carried. As they neared the center of the drawbridge, the king, as if suddenly aware of some unseen power, said, Oh, I feel there is danger near. Then the horseman shook his spear and startled the little bluebird, so that she nearly lost her footing. But what was much more serious was this caused her to loosen her hold upon the little magic gold ring which slipped from between her bill and fell into the waters of the moat. Like a falling star, it shivered and glimmered in the rays of the moon as it descended, attracting the attention of a speckled trout who opened his mouth and swallowed it as it splashed upon the silvery surface of the water. Your trusty spear has done me good service in times gone by, exclaimed the king, not knowing that its owner had unknowingly been the cause of saving him at the present moment. On they came, the attendants of the king inside the castle, opening the gates and allowing him and his men to enter the courtyard. Ned looked down from his window and wondered what had become of the bluebird. He did not feel afraid, but at the same time, he realized that he was not in friendly hands. The giant, on hearing the gates open, had quickly drawn in his feet and was struggling to get his shoes on when Ned appeared at the door. It's all up, said the big fellow with a wry face and a cat 
pitch in his gruff voice. I can already feel the pine needles beginning to stick out all over me. Oh, that's goosebumps, replied Ned, smiling in spite of the seriousness of the situation. It might not be as bad as you think. Just then, a great pounding on the front doors told them that the king was seeking admittance. Who has locked the doors? he shouted. Wait a minute, said the sweet voice of the princess. We did not expect you so late. And she ran down the stairs and opened the door herself. I have two visitors upstairs, she said, as the angry king stepped inside. What? he shouted. Bring them to me. How do I know that they are not enemies? Indeed they are not, she replied, as you will see in 500 short seconds. Ned, come down, she called. Bring your friend with you, for I would have you meet the king. Ned turned to the giant, whose big face was twitching with fear. He'll recognize me as sure as eggs is eggs, he groaned. What is that thunder? exclaimed the king below, mistaking the giant's moan for a thundercap. But before his question was answered, Ned and his friend appeared at the head of the stairway. After shaking hands with Ned in quite a friendly way, the king turned to the giant. Ha ha, he cried. Have I not had the pleasure of meeting you before, my fine friend? The giant said nothing, for what could he say? Haven't I met you before? repeated the king with a fierce gesture. Methinks you would look better as a pine tree than a hulking giant. And before the words were fairly out of the king's mouth, a stately pine tree was standing in the courtyard, through which the wind of the early morning made a moaning noise much like the pitiful groan of the poor late giant. And you, my little cockatoo, continued the king turning quickly to Ned, would look better in a cage. And in another minute, Ned found himself in a wicker cage suspended from the lowest limb of the pine tree. And now, cried the wicked king, where is your third guest? The princess paused a moment. Oh, the, the little bluebird, she exclaimed. Where has it gone? No, not the little bluebird, but he that was the bluebird. At this, the poor princess became very pale. She had hidden her brother the evening before when they had gone to bed in a closet in her room, hoping to have the opportunity of disguising him and sending him away with Ned and the giant first thing in the morning. But now her stepfather suspected something, for why else should he ask for him? She was in despair, for she knew not what to say. And where was Ned's little friend, the bluebird herself, all this time? Had she deserted her friends? The little princess asked herself. Answer my question, cried the king, grabbing a hold of her wrist. The princess screamed, and her brother, hearing her cry, rushed forth from the closet and down the stairs. He raised his voice and made for the king. Ah, bravery and valor do not always win, little rooster, cried the king. You must grow larger before you tackle an old rooster like me. And since you remind me of one, a rooster you shall be. And in five short seconds, the little prince was changed into a young rooster. 
Out into the courtyard, cried the king. A castle is no chicken house. And the little prince found himself thrown under the big pine tree. Have pity, cried the little princess. Is there no pity for a little orphan princess? Enough, answered the king with a stamp of his foot. Go to your room, or you may find yourself also changed into a bird, or a tree, or a pretty butterfly. So the unhappy little princess went up the stairs, crying bitterly to her own room. Closing the door, she leaned out of the window and sobbed as if her heart would break. For a moment, she did not notice that the topmost branch of the pine tree was close to her window. In fact, she would not have noticed it for some time probably, as her face was buried in her hands, had not the branch brushed against her fingers. As she withdrew her hands from her face, she heard the giant's voice, very much subdued, speaking to her. Ned says not to despair, for he feels sure that his little friend, the bluebird, will yet find a way to free us all. Great was the grief of the little bluebird as she skimmed over the waters of the moat, realizing how impossible it was for her to regain the lost ring. She had not the heart for the moment to return to the castle to inform Ned of his loss. So she perched herself sadly on a bush which grew close to the edge of the moonlit water, wondering what was best to do. Suddenly the speckled trout rose to the surface and seeing how sad the pretty bluebird was, asked why. Ah, me, she sighed in answer. I have lost a magic gold ring, and I don't know what to do or how to recover it. At this, the speckled trout flapped his silvery tail gleefully and answered, Worry no more, pretty bluebird, for I have it safely tucked away inside of me. If that be the case, sir trout, joyously chirped the happy bird, swim at your greatest speed and deliver the ring to Her Majesty, the Waterfall Fairy, Queen of the Lake. Tell her that Ned, her little mortal friend, is in danger and that he needs her help. That I will gladly do, answered the speckled trout, and without more delay, he darted off down the moat toward the dam at the farther side, over which the water ran in a clear stream into the purling brook, which finally led to the lake where lived Ned's friend, the Fairy Queen. Down the silvery cascade he glided and whirled away through the running water, frightening the minnows and miller's thumbs lying among the stones in the shallow places and startling the crawfishes and little freshwater lobsters hidden under the hollow banks. And that is the end of this part. Good night. Sleep tight. <laughs>